good morning everyone how's the morning yeah so i'm pragya and i'm from the terry communications and i would like to extend my heartiest welcome so uh, thank you so much for taking time out for this media roundtable conference as you're aware that terry has done a pioneering work in the field of environment climate action research advocacy and is leading the way in finding innovative solutions to the climate crisis this is the momentous year for terry which is also celebrating its 50th year we are extremely grateful that the friends from media have played a key role in highlighting terry's achievements in all these years we continue to look forward to your support i would also like to welcome our esteemed panel comprising honorable minister mr batmi rayalu ministry of agriculture and sustainable energy fiji dr amar bhattacharya senior fellow brookings initiatives on climate research and action and ambassador manjeet puri distinguished fellow terry as you know terry is organizing the 23rd edition of the world sustainable development summit under under the umbrella theme of leadership for sustainable development and climate justice the opening day of the summit has already seen a series of sessions where climate experts thought leaders business leaders government representatives terry terry's distinguished researchers and other stakeholders all came together for an engaging discussion on several pressing matters related to climate action and sustainable development as you all know the challenges affecting the work on sustainable development goals are interconnected and it will need a collective sustained effort towards creating a more sustainable future hence this media round table on leadership for sustainable development and climate justice will seek to understand the diverse perspectives address the need for determined national and global leadership and techniques to promote climate justice in the contemporary context i would now request arti to take the discussions forward thank you thanks very much uh, for again many congratulations to terry on the 50th year it's a rite of passage for a lot of us who have worked on 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 sustainable development issues uh, in india and you know we've all had uh, stints at terry and uh, and definitely the indian uh, indian research community working on climate have a lot to owe to terry uh, on on the training and the indoctrination uh, thanks uh, very much as well uh, the esteemed uh, panel as pragya said uh, you know this is essentially the sidelines of uh, of the meeting uh, that terry is hosting an annual affair and you know as 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 i've seen it evolve over the last 20 years uh, it's quite a learning experience on how sustainability itself has become far more uh, far more uh, center uh, of debate uh, in the two decades uh, that that the wsds uh, has been running it used to be called the dsds before the delhi sustainable development summit but i think what has become uh, even more crucial is the whole discussion on how uh, the world's climate is changing faster than even models uh, predicted we have an esteemed panel here we are going to spend the next 40 minutes or so in hearing from uh, each one of our experts on how do they see climate as an underlying issue in the areas that they focus on whether it's diplomacy or its governance or it's the international financial architecture it's more and more clear that that the way climate is becoming intertwined in these discussions there is a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom that is to be needed if the world is to solve climate change net zero will not be a unilateral uh, goal and neither the solutions uh, will be very straightforward uh, and simple but that's what we will try uh, and break down here attached to it is a whole concept of climate justice uh, in two different words climate and justice also mean a lot and together i think they mean uh, everything on how action must be taken who should act first uh, who should have the right to develop and even while preserving the right to develop how is it that those countries also make sure that they do it right the first time because possibly the world does not have a never ending uh, time to keep burning fossil fuels and extracting coal oil and gas like they are doing right now so this is you know a very complicated picture many pieces arrange themselves in in some kind of a composition but i think uh, that is what uh, we will try and and get out from our speakers thanks uh, very much uh, honorable minister uh, rayalu uh, 
Dr. Amar Bhattacharya and as well as uh, Mr. Manjeev Puri. I've heard uh, I've heard you uh, just now, uh, Honorable Minister, at the other panel in the plenary. And, you know, my first question uh, is to you. You come from Fiji. Uh, there is lesser, uh, lesser that is said, I think, the better on how much uh, climate impacts uh, a vulnerable island like uh, like Fiji will face. Fiji has been quite important in the whole debate on climate action and climate justice uh, the last uh, many years as well. How do you view the whole concept of climate justice? How do you think, uh, you know, global uh, mechanisms like the loss and damage fund are important to bring more action to 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 island nations like yourself? And how do you see the role of uh, the role of international negotiations process evolving in the climate debate. I packed in a lot, but you can uh, you can take what you what you like to, and will be nice to hear some of your perspectives on the importance of a changing climate and the changing world order. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, discussions on uh, leadership for sustainable sustainable development and climate justice. Um, I am always excited uh, when I come to forums as such because uh, there are a variety of reasons. I come from uh, a small island uh, developing state in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, called Fiji. And having come to India, almost half of my country is uh, made up of uh, the Indian uh, diaspora. So I always love coming to India because of this, but uh, as for the discussions that we're having today, I said that, you know, I come from a small island developing city, which is highly vulnerable to the effects of uh, climate change. It's something that uh, I see every day, uh, something that uh, I witness uh, from the... Uh, Coastal degradation to loss of arable land due to uh, increased uh, you know, salt water levels to the washing away of our rivers and uh, you know the relocation of uh, villages in our provinces, uh, sea water seeping through uh, the whole village. We see this uh, with our own eyes, you know, the effect or the negative effect of climate change. So, having said that, you know, this is where our ancestors have chosen to live. Uh, and it is part of the globe. And as such, our problem is a global problem. Uh, we all live in a, in a globe, and I always say that uh, it is like uh, we are all in a canoe. We are all paddling in the canoe. And if one of us is going to uh, suddenly fall asleep and not paddle, and the, the journey is going to be affected. It either slows down or we will get caught in a natural disaster or a canoe will sink. And so much so, uh, our globe. We live in a globe uh, that belongs to all of us, regardless of uh, the size of your country. It is our globe. It is a globe that belongs to humans. And as such... We all have a responsibility when it comes to saving the globe. Because 
whatever Fiji or the small Pacific Island states are undergoing, what they're going through uh, as part of uh, the, the effects of climate change. If you say it's not your problem, then I tell you one day it's going to reach your very doorstep. You know, so that's why I'm always excited to come to such forums and uh, and speak. Because I will speak not only from the mind, but from the heart. The heart of my people. Uh, I am from Fiji. But from another small island off the mainland. So you can imagine the extent that I am uh, speaking from on behalf of my people. You know, my island is a very small island, but like I said, our ancestors sailed the uh, seven seas for thousands of years, and then they chose to live in a very small island. Right? Perhaps they didn't like uh, authority too much, you know. They wanted to be their own bosses uh, because we have a lot of warrior stories, you know, uh, from places that they came from much bigger than where we are. But regardless of that, we now live on a small island that we call our home. And for us to talk about the effects of climate change and what should be done by the powers that be you know, that call the shots. It's a matter of survival. It's not a matter of just talk and uh, useless talk. No. For us, it's a matter of survival. Our islands are sinking. I already said that. And villages are being relocated. But that will not stop. You know, the damage or the effects that climate change has had on our people. You know very well when communities move from where they used to be, you know, all the attachments, generations, you know, investments are affected. So this is what we want to bring to the world. You know, we don't want to sit back and uh, and just cry over it. But we are doing something about it. As a government, uh, the government of Fiji has done a lot. I, I said that during my speech this morning, that uh, Fiji is part of, uh, of uh, the uh, COP uh, as contributed significantly well. Even uh, I was told by Ambassador Puri that uh, Fiji contributed significantly to the SDGs. So, you know, we are not trying to be a crybaby here. Not at all. You look at me, you know I can't be a crybaby because of my size. We play rugby back in Fiji, which is one of the roughest sports in the world. One of the toughest. It's a game only for tough people. But we live in the islands that is vulnerable to climate change. Okay? We are doing all we can as a people, as a government, to mitigate the effects of climate change. But we still need help. And the help has come in the form of partnerships with the Indian government, partnerships with uh, organizations like Terry. And we are so thankful for that. Of course, we have other partners that uh, we work with to uh, help us in the, the mitigation part. And we have introduced policies also to help us 
on the path to proper, mind you, proper mitigation. We don't want to invest in uh, mitigation projects that will be put in there for 10 years. And after 10 years, it's all destroyed and gone. Okay. So we are experimenting with, uh, you know, uh, mitigation projects that can can be sustainable and uh, take us into the future. But having said that, we are also building a resilience, you know, as part of the whole thing amongst our people, teaching them, you know, to be better custodians of the resources that we own and not to exploit them too much. I alluded to uh, a few of those um, during my speech this morning uh, where we are allocating 30% of our exclusive economic zone to be marine protected areas, and that is a huge giveaway because for some of our island people, the sea is all they have to survive. So to give away 30% of that exclusive economic zone is, is a tough ask. But this is what I'm talking about. And uh, again, it has been through partnerships with uh, organizations like CI International and, uh, and other NGOs. So I'm thankful uh, for the invitation to be here. And I hope that uh, I have made sense with uh, my uh, few minutes contribution. Thank you. Thanks very much, Honorable Minister. Made a lot of sense. I think the, uh, the, the emotion of being on the canoe and somebody not pedaling and, and others getting equally impacted is a very profound one and has not been missed. But I also also noted what you said on proper mitigation and you know, there definitely needs to be more balance as well on mitigation versus adaptation. There is too much that you that you cannot achieve if you don't build resilience. And I think that realization is is dawning on the international community, at least is slightly more visible at the international negotiation process with the focus on adaptation, loss and damage and and then coming to mitigation. I will keep moving and maybe uh, Dr. Amar Bhattacharya, in your role as a senior fellow at Brookings uh, and also responsible for climate research and action, you've had a long-standing career as well at the World Bank. At this moment, the one place where every discussion on climate is hinging is on finance. Last year was a big discussion on what the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, started and came to be known as the Bridgetown Agenda. There was focus as well on talking about the reform process of banks. Uh, in simple terms, as I understand, it just means giving more confidence that capital will be available and actually also making that capital available. What lies in the details of all of this? What kind of architecture reform is needed? Is anything happening or the discussions on finance will always be lacking transparency and accountability? I think just uh, your views and insights on the importance of finance, where the reform process is, how much the international financial architecture even needs to consider being reformed for, for climate uh, goals to become real, and where is that discussion going to head in, especially in, in this year and the next, because there is the, in the international process, there is the agreement that is has to come on the new quantitative collective goal, which means a new figure and 100 billion is done, but a new figure has to come. But uh, if, if you can throw some light on everything to do with finance, with respect to climate, uh, let's hear from you. Um, thank you very much, Arte. Um, so I'm going to actually frame my my uh, comments based on the theme uh, of the summit and also 
really commend Terry uh, for making this summit a quite signature moment for the world, not just for Terry. Um, and of course, congratulate Terry on its 50th anniversary. So if you think about the theme we have, sustainable development and climate justice, the starting point is that, you know, the sustainable development goals were perhaps, and, you know, and Ambassador Puri had a lot to do with it. Uh, it, it, it was one of those moments of aspiration for the world. But we are today, you know, half more than halfway to the SDGs uh, behind on most goals in most places. Uh, second, uh, you know, we are, uh, as the global stock take uh, has highlighted, uh, behind in meeting the climate goals, not only in terms of of the temperature goal, but also with regard to uh, to res resilience. And as we see, the impact of climate change is accelerating with disproportionate impact on the developing world. The impact, of course, is the greatest on the highly vulnerable island states of the world. But as we saw from the Africa Climate uh, Summit, you know, last September, it's also extreme for the whole continent of Africa. And being here in India and being an Indian, I have to say that we are the 10th most vulnerable country to climate change. So climate justice is really a existential issue for much of the developing world. And if you go to Latin America, they will tell you that you know their vulnerability is also extreme. So the answer to this is that, well, the, the reason for this is because in some sense, you know, we have not taken the action, but the action that is necessary is actually investing in the new economy, in a low carbon economy and investing in resilience, tackling loss and damage. And for that, we do need a significant sum of money. How much? Uh, our assessment, I, and I should say uh, that, you know, one of the reasons I'm not commenting on this so much from the hat of Brookings, but more as my hat as the executive secretary of the independent high-level expert group on climate finance commissioned by the well, commissioned originally by the COP26 and COP27 presidencies, and now also the COP28 presidencies. So our latest report actually sets out an agenda which is intended in some sense to deliver on the sustainable development and climate justice. And that investment is, you know, 2.4 trillion uh, for the developing world other than China. But if we, if the way I look at it is that is an investment, it's not a cost. If you invest that money, you get not only the climate results, but you get the sustainable development results. And the opportunity that we have for actually creating much, much better forms of growth that will serve not only climate, but will allow the developing world to leapfrog many of the mistakes that had you know, affected the rich countries. So in order to do that, we need in some sense fundamental change. For, for now for, I don't know how many, since 2009, we've been debating the 100 uh, billion of climate finance commitment. It looks like we will meet that commitment or we will have met that commitment maybe even in 2022, but we will certainly meet it in 2023. In comparison with the amount of investment we need, we will need something like 2.4 trillion in investment and finance and an annual basis by 20. out one and a half energy transition, about 300 billion for adaptation and resilience, about 300 billion for loss and damage, and about another 300 billion for natural capital, including sustainable agriculture. 
These may seem as large numbers, but if you look at them in the context of uh, investment and investment in this new economy, they are actually quite manageable. But in order to deliver that investment, the international financial architecture has to change. We as developing countries have to recognize that actually we will probably have to make a large amount of that investment ourselves. Indeed, domestic resource mobilization, which is a bad word in international negotiation, is a good word when it comes to sustainable development. Because that says self-responsibility and our own contributions will matter. And in that context, we have to particularly start pricing the bad, carbon pricing, for example. We have to stop harmful subsidies, not just in terms of fossil fuels, but in agriculture, many other areas. And that will generate a lot of resources. And obviously, we have to do what is necessary to put our fiscal house in order. Many, many developing countries are doing this, so we should not see this as an area of weakness, but we should build on that in getting the foundations of finance, because without that, no amount of international finance will solve the problem. Having said that, we will need a significant amount of international finance. You know, we have argued, and Nick Stern and myself in particular, that we will need about a trillion dollars ex external finance to meet the needs of the developing world. Incidentally, that was the figure that Prime Minister Modi put out in Glasgow. It was not, you know, it happens to be exactly the figure, but we have given the, let's say, the analytical basis to say, yes, that's a reasonable number. A lot of it will have to come from the private sector because private investment will be a very, very important driver of the change we are talking about. And at the moment, the amount of private finance that we have in the table, you know, is very, very small, especially from the external world. We, we believe that we will need to increase private finance by 15 times, but that private finance has to be not just uh, there, but it has to be accessible and it has to be affordable. When you look, for example, now at the financing costs for, uh, for renewable energy, it's, you know, about six to seven percent, you know, in the developed world. It is reasonable now in a country like India compared to even five years ago. But in much of Africa, the cost of finance is just exorbitant. You know, so we have to make not just have the finance available, but we have to make it affordable. Second, you know, we have to recognize that particularly for resilience, you know, we will need to make investments that are very long term, where private finance will not be able to provide a significant sum. So we will need development finance and we will need concessional finance for that. And we again argue that the scaling up of development finance will be absolutely central. In the G20, Presidency of India had launched a, a special review uh, co-chaired by Dr. N.K. Singh and Larry Summers. I was associated with that effort. And we argued that we need to triple the amount of financing from development finance institutions that can play both a catalytic role vis-a-vis -vis private finance, but also enhance affordable long-term finance necessary, for example, for adaptation and resilience. Finally, we will need concession of high, almost near grant finance to deal with loss and damage. You know, there are there is no such thing as a good hurricane. Hurricanes wipe out in, you know, in the island states, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of GDP. The only way to deal with that is adequate loss and damage, also for slow onset events that are affecting, you know, particularly highly vulnerable countries. The loss and damage uh, agreement on the loss and damage fund is significant. But let me put it in perspective. I said that we probably will need something like 300 billion in terms of loss and damage by 2030. The loss and damage fund that has now been kind of set up has received 1 billion, one shot 
in terms of financing. So if we are serious, we will have, a, have to completely transform the amount of funding we need for loss and damage. And similarly for natural capital, like protection of forests, protection of oceans and the like. Where is that money going to come from? So for, you know, I mean, we as developing countries have, of course, shouted from the rooftop and said, you rich countries have created this problem and you're not living up to your, to your obligation. That is climate injustice. And there is absolute truth to that. But we will not be able politically and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, realistic if we expect that that money will all come from the rich world. It just simply will not. You know, even if we double the amount of bilateral concessional assistance, we will go from 30 billion to 60 billion. That is nowhere near enough. So we are arguing that we have to have more predictable sources of concessional finance that can be deployed for these highly urgent tasks. What are such predictable sources? One is carbon markets. So voluntary carbon markets or compliance carbon markets where there is a commitment to use some of the pro proceeds for international tasks. And we have to uh, you know, think about ways of allocating this to you know, particularly the, the vulnerably and, uh, affected countries. Second, we have to have international tax measures such as taxing shipping, taxing aviation, so that we can generate predictable resources, low-cost resources for funding priority needs. And third, we might be able to get some additionality from you know, innovative ways like SDR recycling and SDR rechanneling. So we have to put a lot of emphasis also on that pillar, which is expanding concessional finance. I finally want to say that in all of this, we have to think as developing countries about the opportunities that come from actually investing in this new possibilities. So if you think about you know, the new uh, green economy, there are many challenges we will face, but there are also tremendous opportunities that there that exist. So we believe that you know if you take those opportunities, we can actually unlock the growth story of the 21st century, an inclusive growth story. Why? Because if you invest in the developing world, you are creating the basis of the growth and development in those countries, but you are also injecting tremendous new power, new engines of growth that can power the global economy. So we are at an inflection point. Indeed, we are concerned about climate justice, but in tackling sustainable and climate justice, we can actually create a better world for all. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Patacharya. I think uh, you said everything that must have been said on on the issue of finance, but also the the catch twenty two around it. Uh, we need to, to leave frog. We need fundamental change, but we also need innovative sources. And you know, with the way things are going, one is not sure you know how you will break uh, the cycle and and where from. Uh, definitely, you know the the way the $1 billion was celebrated on the first day of Dubai as the loss and damage fund and the gap that must be filled for $300 billion is quite clear in terms of how difficult it will be to fill that gap. And you have to find, uh, you have to find ways and means to even look at filling, you know, the next second billion, uh, let's say it like that. But I think everything that you said on reducing cost of capital, even, uh, you know, just putting up a solar plant, uh, still the the cost of capital will be even 12%, 14% for a country like South Africa, maybe even 18, 20% for a country like Zambia, still 8 to 9% in, in India. And, you know, that's where a lot of the solar potential actually will lie. So how is it that, you know, we also get the rubber to meet the road and there is there is some agreement on what finance is. If it is not really about the rich uh, paying, paying to those who are most affected or, or, or to the poor, 
then what are the where is the place to find agreement i think i'm i'm floundering for words because it's such a tricky concept and every time we talk about it we don't we t- we don't take it anywhere but we really got all the theory and 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 how to do it uh, right it's just a matter of not being able to implement at that speed and scale that's needed for the climate crisis which is also facing us uh, with that speed and scale uh, i will uh, invite ambassador uh, manjeev puri uh, doesn't need much introduction is not only a distinguished fellow in terry has been a key negotiator from india's side uh, during copenhagen during the paris agreement as well as negotiate negotiated uh, from india's side on uh, un especially the sustainable development goals and and was the ambassador of india to several countries sir so your experience of international policy is second to none you've also watched very closely the climate debate we are sitting among a global global uh, crisis which is not climate alone there are defense military issues which are being escalated as we speak and on the other hand there are climate disasters that are also happening at the same time when we are only looking at the climate negotiations the whole issue of fossil fuels and phasing out is the trickiest issue which we want to wrap uh, our arms around but we always uh, skirt the issue and and address it only at the fences how do you think the next two or three years will play out in terms of climate diplomacy where are the levers to place things to focus on and any other perspectives that you have to share also having heard minister rayalu and uh, dr bhattacharya speak uh, arti thank you very much <clears throat> and on behalf of terry i want to welcome all of you here thank you for what you said yourself um arti i am very honored to be on this panel with the honorable minister and yesterday we were together also in another panel you know fiji chaired the g77 when the sdgs were approved so it's a country which has contributed and contributed for all of us so your excellency you're very right when you say we are in a canoe and everyone needs to paddle in fact yesterday at the inaugural the chairman of terry said something very interesting most people would turn around and say world sustainable development summit i mean why world we want to do something globally this that and the other but he made a very interesting perspective and think about this that the issue of sustainable development the issue of climate is actually a global problem and hence world not that you just want everyone together but because we are in the canoe together and that's the importance and we have dr ama bhattacharya you know perhaps at the moment the man providing certain solutions on what is needed in the most important thing and let's be very clear and let's be adult enough money makes the world go round and amar thank you very much for the specific ideas that you put forward but more than that the fact of the huge amount of focus that you brought to the subject and which takes us forward now i want to you know make this also a little light hearted but enjoy this for what it's worth there was a time several years back when there used to be a bit of a debate that is climate change happening is global warming happening and the word then used to be climate deniers etc i am not saying that these people don't exist in the world i am not saying that but i think the genie is out of the bottle and it's moved on and today yes several people very powerful people can say that but i think the world has accepted and the world has moved on there are also some lived factors so yesterday minister ayalu mentioned to us the ingress of sea water in some of the atolls in fiji it's a lived experience look at our regions whether it's the floods or what's happened in europe what's happened in the united states let's leave us developing countries out we in any case according to them always exaggerate no look what's happened to them so this loss and damage is actually a fact the fund is about what can you do to help mitigate the situation in the most egregious of situations in the developing world but i want to therefore leave with you a very interesting uh, a thought which i think is interesting climate change is real climate change is happening and we need to tackle it both sides mitigation as well as we need to adapt there's no doubt 
on any of those. But global negotiations, global coming together, and the quest for collaboration is, I'm afraid, susceptible to the same old issues which have bedeviled the world from the time that we started coming together, which is about issues of global power politics, global power play, hegemony, etc. And we can't run away from that. I'm going to quote to you something very interesting. Some of you may not have heard it, but Minister, you did hear me. Do you remember COP26 in Glasgow and the end issues that were talked about, the fossil fuels issues that were focused? And you could imagine what the economist, the sort of guru of world knowledge, if I may say so in the English language, would have had to say. Do you know what they had to say after COP28? The first and interesting thing is that they acknowledged that the pessimists lost out. We actually had an agreement without doing what was very normal in all COPs, running three days behind schedule, working till 4.30 in the morning and producing something. These guys may have gone a few hours beyond, beyond that. But if you don't go beyond a few hours be, beyond the time schedule, people think you are not serious enough. But actually, it was a neat, clean agreement that got produced. How did it get produced? I'm going to read out something to you, Aarti. And this is in the context of what you said. The call to phase out fossil fuels was both economically infeasible and politically naive. 2023, what happened in 2021? Let's understand the politics of the change, the economics of the change. The shoe pinches most when it's yours. So the issues of conflict in the world, the factors that have affected energy supplies, all of these have resulted in what was done. And let me point out something else to you. It's very interesting. I didn't think of this, but the Azerbaijani ambassador pointed it out to us. The COP after Glasgow was held in Egypt, which, by the way, is a fairly large oil producer. We all know UAE. And you know where the next COP is? Baku, Azerbaijan, which is a major oil producing country and a major oil exporting country. So perhaps good idea. Because what is sustainable development? It is about ensuring both development and sustainability for the world. So it isn't a fight and we shouldn't look at it like this. We need to look at it in terms of collaboration. A simple word is we should do it smartly. But actually, on a more serious plane, you have to do development. And let me also leave another thought with you. The developed world, can you tell them, stop growing, stop bettering your life? Can you really tell them that? Yes, we would say it as a talking point. That, you know, you've done more than enough. Your share is way beyond. If the global average is some three or four tons of CO2 emissions, you are at 16, very bad, this, that. But, you know, in the end, that doesn't sell. We're talking about real-world negotiation. But let me leave with you why I think that the global negotiations, no matter some hiatus, and, you know, we know this is an election year in the most important country in the world. We also know what happened after Paris. But let's leave all that aside because the genie is out of the bottle. And consequently, the world has started recognizing. And I want to take you back to what Dr. Amar Bhattacharya said. It's business. You remember Bill Clinton was famously told, it's the economics, stupid. What is the economics? Today, you know, among the largest investors in clean technologies are oil companies. Now, this may not be their largest investor. Huh? So, I mean, we should make we'll be very clear. But in the field that we are, they are also large players. Because there's a recognition. And the answer is not necessarily solar. There are so many things. In the end, we'll have to find a, a fuel substitute. This thing which held us for 250 years, there's a sell-by date. We'll have to look for that. And who are the people who are best in a position to do it? Those who have the money, the abilities, and so on and so forth. They are also in a position to implement. And so, let me take you back to his words. 
it's the private sector and the fact that the realization has dawned. They may take a step backwards, find a way of producing profits for a particular year. That's, you know, that's the way the free market operates. But in the longer run, now the direction is set. Now, what are they doing? What? One thing which is happening, somewhat known to us and somewhat not known, is that technology as well as science are working on a plethora of ideas. We hear a lot about hydrogen, you know, whether it's green, blue, gray, etc. We look at a lot about hydrogen, geothermal energy, even nuclear. You know, this COP was the first time that the words nuclear got added in the uh, thing. Can you imagine that happening a few years back? I don't know what would have happened. Pessimists would have won. But the world is wanting to think and answer. And the world is coalescing. And let me assure you that the role of the private sector, business in particular, and I'll use the word business instead of private sector, the role of business is a critical one because money does make the world go round. So there's a lot of technological development. But I want to come down to you know a few final elements of my comments. Money. Money is important. If you just look at the figures that Dr. Amabhattacharya mentioned, you know, whether it's those $5 trillion which was mentioned in the, uh, the G20 document or it's the $3.9 trillion that was mentioned in the next report or whatever, we're talking about trillions of dollars. Okay. Are the trillions of dollars not available in the world? They are not available in the developing world. To again go back to what he mentioned, the need for flows into the developing world is tremendous and estimated at whatever numbers. Uh, you can say 1 trillion, 2 trillion, whatever. But in the trillions. But is the money available in the world? The answer is yes. Please look at global savings rates. Look at the saving rates in the developed world. How do we channel these money? So one very important aspect which was again highlighted was the cost of capital. And you know, while we can always say one thing, that if I am an investor from a big developed country, in my own country for various reasons, stability, I know the game, etc. I may even accept 2-3% rate of interest, rate of return. But when it comes to investing overseas, I feel the risk is higher. And when it comes to the developing world, I don't know what it means. So I'll want 8%, 10%, even as somebody said, 18%. Now this Barbados initiative put out something very interesting, something that at least I've been saying very often. Actually, there are several elements to this risk for overseas investment. There is this policy certainty. There are issues in terms of all these movements, etc., expectations. But there's a very technical thing, which is the question of what are the foreign exchange risks? If any of you come from the corporate world, the word used in the finance companies are not these economics terms, but a very simple thing. What are the cost of hedging? And you know what the cost of hedging is? Even for a country like India and our largest companies, it runs into numbers which are multiples currently of the rate at which the loans, the money can be raised, the equity can be raised overseas. And so I've always plugged that one of the bigger reforms we can do is to try and do something institutionally. The World Bank, the IMF regulates or many of these things, the World Bank was fundamentally formed in terms of not really a grant says that said IDA was very low in terms of uh, the, the rates of interest charged. But basically in terms of an extension in a, in a very interesting manner to this issue of what can you do in terms of grants, help people out. But let me look at something else. If they can become or an element of them, an institutional arrangement can be set up by which you facilitate this move. And there are lots of ways. 
you know, guarantees, first loss guarantees, an insurance product. There are lots and lots of ways of doing it. And if you can help at least have a segue for large sums in the developed world to flow to countries in the developing world which have the largest necessity and capability, then believe me, funds would also become available for what Amar just put, the need for grant finance. And therefore, you have lots of opportunities of that kind. That's a plug that I've been making. Some people have looked at it. It's not an easy one. These things are always very difficult to do. But I just want to mention this to you, that we would need collaboration. And one of the areas that we need to collaborate is certainly money. It's not just that we say it because it's the easiest thing to say, but because money actually makes things go around. It leads to technological development. It needs to investment, needs to lots of things. The global power play game. My answer can't be better than your answer. We know what is going to be unfolding in the whole world in the course of this year. There are implications of that. And even in the worst case scenario, what will happen? A little bit of a time lag. But if I look at the largest economy in the world, do note the kind of actions which have taken place at sub-regional level, at cities level, etc. If any of you have been to the United States in the recent months, year, etc. to come, let me assure you that at least in the Northeast and California, which are really the big major hubs, the change towards doing things sustainable is palpable and visible to anyone to see. And this is the country with, in a, as a large country, the most profligate carbon footprint. But the change is perceptible. And frankly, that genie can't go back into the bottle. Thank you. Very well said, uh, Ambassador Puri. As ever, uh, lots there, but also very spiky and not holding back any punches. I was in San Francisco last week and uh, for the five minutes I was on the road, I just saw that uh, in, in a minute, I saw more than 10 electric cars just on the road. And you can feel, you know, like you said, it's palpable. It's with the people. It, the, the, that change is not just at some boardroom meetings and discussions. And, you know, it's it's out there and people are willing and ready to, to embrace that change. Uh, maybe I will open the floor because there is lots actually that has been said on the importance of finance, the changing world order, the importance of spending money on clean uh, and looking at concessional finance, the various sources that are there. I wanted to ask uh, if there is any questions from the room, if there are any, yes, please go on. I think you can speak up and it will be fine still. I'm Prabhi Kumar Singh from World Intellectual Foundation. Uh, as uh, Amar Bhattacharya sir uh, very well said, it is an inflection point for climate justice. But to Puri sir, uh, sir. Hello. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is an inflection point for uh, climate justice. But uh, simultaneously, the world order is grappli grappling with too many challenges, including those ones regarding the conflicts and the wars in different uh, pockets of the world and regions. And so to speak, uh, the countries, particularly the superpowers, super economies are fueling them somehow. So, uh, I mean, uh, there is a largely high carbon footprint, high emission and food insecurity. So, in a nutshell, they are flailing and inverting the whole uh, whole stock of efforts for climate justice. So, sir, uh, is there any, as you said, real world negotiation? Is there any uh, real world negotiation or quantification uh, of the very uh, carbon footprint and the the cost the humanity is, uh, I mean, having uh, on those ends? Uh, this one. Is your territory. Look, um, 
I read out to you what the economist wrote. Do you think this would have happened if some of the things were not happening? I don't know the, the actual numbers. Uh, I'm sure uh, people like Dr. Bhattacharya and Brookings and others are working on that. But it's palpable. It's easily noticeable. Look at the fuel costs. Even in the United States, which is actually a major fuel producing country by itself. They're rising, isn't it? We managed deft diplomacy. We were able to manage well. But many others have not been able to manage. So you see this. You are absolutely right in what you said. You know, yesterday we had a panel where the Honorable Minister was also present. And the Prime Minister of Guyana spoke many things. But he mentioned one word in the midst of it. Of course, there's a contextualization in his own context. The question of peace. And I was reminded of what the Honorable Prime Minister said a year and a half back. It's not the era of war. If you have peace, you'll have abilities to do a lot of these things. But let me just take a minute and go back to your things. All this is true and this is global hegemony. But with the private sector and the business sectors now figuring out that this particular action is the way of the future. The pressures on everybody will be tremendous that you need to do something about greening, you need to do something about global warming, you need to do something about climate change. Why? Because those who matter today see their own vested interest in this tomorrow. That we, India, large developing countries, China, we are all also part of those who can find solutions is good luck for all of us. But in the end, vested interests of the haves becomes the vested interest of the world. And this is a canoe that we all need to paddle together. Thanks very much. Uh, any other questions? While people think uh, maybe from what has been said, I wanted to ask uh, Honorable Minister if there is anything that you uh, have to share on your perspective on how uh, you know like a lot of the a lot of countries which are not just the global north are claiming their space uh, in discussions around climate diplomacy and if there is a perspective to share from your side uh, It'll be nice to hear, uh, you know, the Pacific Islands also negotiate uh, as a block. Uh, the small island uh, developing states negotiate as another block. There is G77 plus China as well, which is a very large group of a spectrum of countries that's there. Uh, there is AOSIS, the Association of Small Islands. And, you know, there is vulnerability defined across uh, each of them. And then, of course, they are the typical Annex 1 countries and, and the West, uh, so to speak. But, you know, at least from a very Indian perspective, I saw how India is really claiming the space and trying to be the voice of Global South. Is there any meaning and matter in that kind of uh, diplomacy? Is that going to bring more climate gains to some of the vulnerable populations living in Global South? Siege. We have the peace siege, which is a Pacific siege. And, uh, you know, we are a region that uh, undergo the same, we're from the same environment and uh, same uh, almost similarity in, uh, in cultures. And uh, for some of the islands within uh, our region, we are, you know, uh, related uh, from uh, through our ancestors. Eh? So uh, that will be a welcome uh, thing to have our own region, because as a as a regional block uh, by ourselves, it puts us in a stronger platform to to voice uh, uh, our our views on uh, on uh, global uh, climate issues. Eh? Uh, also, when it comes to negotiation, uh, like uh, Mr. Batakari said, 
we are stronger when we come together as a region so in uh, negotiations for whether it be for climate finance or whether it be for any other issues um, right now you know, we are grouped together with uh, all uh, small island developing states so you know our our voice uh, not for Fiji but uh, for some of our islands that are really, really small. You know, their voices can be drowned in, uh, you know, during uh, negotiation as, as not being part of a strong block of countries, uh, so to speak. Um, I think the, uh, the idea has already been floated because we have the uh, Pacific Island Forum uh, they meet uh, every year, and uh, uh, this has been part of uh, their discussions. But uh, you know, it uh, it needs a uh, uh, a stronger political will to make it happen. Thank you. Well said, yes, I think it's the whole matter of political will. Before we close, uh, maybe I will let you have, Dr. Bhattacharya, the last word. Uh, finance still remains the elephant in the room. The new uh, goal has to be negotiated. What, in your view, is the final thing to say? I mean, even if you look at IEA figures, like you said, you know, 1.7 trillion apparently was invested into clean energy just last year. 1.1 trillion went into fossil fuels. So while we continue to find innovative sources and concessional finance, I think it's important to also look at how finance is still going into incumbency and in uh, in the fossil fuel sector uh, but that's just uh, you know my thought i'll i'll, I'll let you um, have the last word and say whatever you'd like to on the importance of finance and anything that needs to be said in the context of sustainable development um so i want every developing country negotiator to say what ambassador puri says <laughs> if we did that we would succeed our problem has been that we tend to be backward looking rather than forward looking. And there is now a tremendous space in the negotiation on the new collective quantified goal to actually think about finance for a purpose, not kind of finance to just to make us feel that we won a fight, but finance that delivers the results we want. And the forward looking approach that he laid out recognizing the power of business, recognizing that we will need development finance institutions on steroids, that we have opportunities to really mobilize concessional finance if we are innovative and we can do that. But ultimately, it's about finance for a purpose and the purpose is sustainable development and climate justice. We are, you know, I'll end with one very important win-win for the world. You have to remember that the North is aging and the young are in the South. So investing in the climate economy of the South is the best investment for savers in the North. It will generate, as I said, the new engines of economic growth. And for the South, it will help us develop in a way that avoids all the mistakes that the rich world has made. There will be challenges. You know, Ambassador Puri was saying, what are we going to do with all the solar plants? What are we going to do about critical minerals? There are going to be lots of issues, but those issues are much easier to tackle if we have a common purpose. And the last thing I want to say is we can all we will all benefit if we act together, whether it is carbon pricing, you know, then we will actually send collective signals to the private sector. Suppose if all countries of the world said we are going to phase out internal combustion engines by 2035, 
the signal that it will send to the business sector is so powerful for innovation, not just for investment. So acting together, not just for the developing world, but the, for the world at large, is what will determine success. And that's the spirit I hope we can maintain rather than this is, as is, I mean, again, coming back to what Ambassador Puri and Minister said, we are in the canoe and we have to row, all row together. And if we row together, we row faster. Thanks very much uh, for listening in. I'll uh, hand it back to you. Pragya, and thanks very much, Ambassador Puri, uh, Honorable Minister, and Dr. Bhattacharya for sharing your very insightful perspectives. And definitely, I think, act together is the mantra. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for sharing their valuable insight in this session. Uh, I We will have, before we just wrap up the session, we have small a token of gift as our appreciation. And I would request Hina to please do the needful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for the participation and Arti for moderating it so well. Thank you. And our esteemed panel as well. Thank you.